Join me for a hymn sing at the 2024 Issues Etc. Making the Case Conference, Friday, July 12th, and Saturday, July 13th at Concordia University, Chicago. This year's theme, Hymns for the Battle. Learn more and register at issuesetc.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is brought to you in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF is a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod dedicated to translating and publishing the books of our Lutheran faith into more than 100 languages for our Christian brothers and sisters around the world. Learn how you can take part in their work at lhfmissions.org. Welcome to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The word for guardian here is an interesting one, pedagogos. It denoted in Greek culture the adult who had charge of the boys to get them where they were supposed to go and to protect them from being attacked by sexual predators. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a daily verse-by-verse Bible study with the church, past and present. Pastor Whedon is leading us in a study of the book of Galatians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Greetings, people loved by God. In our last study, St. Paul had appealed to the way human contracts work. One party cannot just willy-nilly change such an agreement on a whim. Rather, they have legal force once they've been ratified. No adding or altering without consent. Paul lifts that whole idea up and applies it to the covenant with Abraham. He first argued that those promises were made to Abraham and his offspring, or better, seed. He insists that the meaning here is not collective, but singular, to one particular seed, that is, to Christ himself. And this promise was put into effect, Paul notes, some 430 years prior to the giving of the law at Sinai. So, the law of Moses cannot annul the covenant which God had previously made, a promise to bless all nations in the seed of Abraham, in Christ. The law, then, cannot invalidate that prior promise, vacate it, make it void. Instead, Paul insists that if the inheritance comes by way of observing the law, then it most certainly does not come by promise, but that's not how God gave it. God gave it to Abraham as a gratuitous promise. The law was never intended by God to be a path toward justification. It had another purpose, to point out sin, which would keep Israel humble and eagerly waiting for the one to whom the promise had been made to finally arrive on the scene. Finally, remember, Paul affirmed the Jewish tradition that the law was given through angels and was handed to Moses as intermediary, but then that odd sentence about God being one. A reading from Galatians, the third chapter, beginning at the 21st verse. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, We are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring heirs according to the promise. Galatians 3, verses 21 through 29. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, without your help, our labor is useless, and without your light, 
our search is in vain. Invigorate our study of your holy word that by due diligence and right discernment, we may establish ourselves and others in your holy faith. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Ready to ponder today's passage together? Let's dig in. Verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Given the sharp distinction Paul has drawn between the law and the gospel, this is a perfectly rational question to ask. Is God schizophrenic? Does he speak contradictory words? Paul's answer is a decided, no way, get real. The problem actually isn't in the law at all. The problem is in us. The law just points out our problem, but without offering any solution. The law would give life indeed if we kept it, and then righteousness would be via the law. But that's not the way things are. Instead, as 4th century teacher Marius Victorinus wrote, We have said that the law given by Moses teaches nothing but sins, admonishing us what sins are and how they are to be avoided. And Scripture draws no other conclusion. Therefore, righteousness is not from the law, that is, Justification and salvation come not from the law, but from faith, as is promised. Again, those old fathers almost sound like the reformers, don't they? Paul goes on, verse 22. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. The Old Testament revelation, the scripture, as Paul uses the term, has this effect. It imprisons everything under sin. It shuts every mouth and robs you of every excuse. Do you remember how Moses in Genesis 6 described the human plight? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Old Testament bears utterly clear witness to this sorry state of humanity apart from grace, a state that begins even in conception. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51 verse 5. But since everyone and everything is imprisoned under sin, God makes a gratuitous promise by faith in Jesus Christ and forks it over to whoever believes him. Verse 23. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. He is not at all implying that the Old Testament believers were without faith. I mean, just think of the great catalog of faith in Hebrews 11. No, Paul means before Christ came, before he revealed his New Testament, we, both Jew and Gentile, were held captive under the law because we both failed to do what God had commanded, either by the law written on the heart or by the law written on tablets of stone and delivered to Moses. We all were captivated as lawbreakers. As Isaiah said and nailed it, Isaiah 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And so, as Paul would later write to the Romans, Romans 3.19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. The law shuts our mouths, silences our attempts at excusing ourselves, and holds us, one and all, accountable to God, guilty before him. And that's how things were until the coming faith would be revealed. The coming faith would be the New Testament revealed in and by our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The word for guardian here is an interesting one, pedagogos, 
it denoted in Greek culture the adult who had charge of the boys to get them where they were supposed to go and to protect them from being attacked by sexual predators. You remember how that was rife in Greek culture. Paul saw the law function in a similar way. It was given to protect you from the predation of pride until Jesus Christ showed up on the scene. The law would always leave you crying out in the words of Psalm 130, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? The law has the capacity to keep you in the humility that realizes that you cannot possibly stand before God on the basis of your obedience to him, since that obedience has not been perfect, unfailing obedience, the kind that God requires. It's been, at best, in fits and starts, and so often grudging and, well, grumpy. The law shows you how much you'd rather go your own way. And in doing this humbling job, the law hands you over to Christ so that you could be justified by faith in him rather than by your pitiful, half-hearted obedience. Verse 25. But now that faith has come, We are no longer under a guardian, verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. The arrival of faith, that is, of the full revelation of God's mercy and love, which Jesus has brought into human flesh in his life, suffering, death, and resurrection, this puts an end to the need of that guardian. Safely handed over to Jesus, you get to be what he himself is, a son of God, he by nature, you by grace. And this all comes about by faith, by entrusting yourself to his gracious promise. Verse 27, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. St. John Chrysostom notes that this is not exactly what you'd expect Paul to conclude. He wonders aloud what it means when he preached this to his congregation in 4th century Antioch. Listen, why didn't he say, all you who were baptized into Christ have been born of God, since that is the inference from showing that they were sons? Because what he says is more awe-inspiring. For if Christ is the Son of God and you put him on, Having the Son inside yourself and being made like him, you have been made one in kind and form. To be baptized into Christ, folks, is to have Christ himself be the very garment in which you are clothed. You are presented in Christ to his Father in his own absolute, pure, perfect obedience to the law. Your mother, the church, dresses you up in your elder brother's clothes so that you may be presented to the Father who (laughs) smells on you the scent of his beloved older son and so delivers to you that son's blessing. Check out Genesis 27. And if you've been wrapped up in Jesus and his righteousness is now your very own, your very garment of holiness, then, verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All the divisions of humanity come crashing to a halt in the waters of baptism. The baptized person isn't a Jew, and he isn't a Greek. He isn't a slave, and she isn't free. He isn't a male, and she isn't a female. All those divisions in the human race lose their meaning when you step into the water where you become one in Christ Jesus. Chrysostom again, the former Jew or slave is clothed in the form not of an angel or archangel, but of the Lord himself and in himself displays Christ. Now, it became popular in the 20th century for proponents of women's ordination to lift this verse out of its context and use it to dismiss what Paul clearly wrote elsewhere about women not exercising the public teaching office. That's an abuse of this passage, because Paul is speaking here about justification before God, where all you need is Christ, and whatever your human status is, is irrelevant. 
He's not talking about the ordering of the Christian's life in this world. To be baptized into Jesus is to stand inside him before the Father. And this is all you need. And here, male and female are irrelevant, as is ethnicity or economic status. Verse 29, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, according to the promise. This is his great point. The promise was made to Abraham's offspring, to Christ. To be baptized into that seed, into Christ, is to be made heirs of the promised blessing. Faith thus suffices, trusting the promises of Christ regarding holy baptism. And that's where we're going to be stopping for today. Next up, Paul will talk about how the law did its job for a time, but how that job ceases when the fullness of time arrives, because that's when the minor child comes into his inheritance and receives all the benefits of his adoption, even being able to call the Heavenly Father Abba by the gift of the Holy Spirit, no longer a slave, but a son and heir. Till next time then, people loved by God, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for listening to The Word of the Lord Endures Forever with Pastor Will Whedon. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a listener-supported program. You can donate by check. Make your check payable to The Word Endures and send it to Box 616, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234. You can also make a secure online contribution at thewordendures.org. The Word of the Lord Endures Forever is a production of LPR, Lutheran Public Radio.